Greetings, salutations, felicitations, aloha, and all, uh, howdy. There's a good one. We'll throw that one in there. And other things that I can't think of, but I'll work on for future podcasts. It's Chris talking to you from the studios of WFC3. This is Monkey Business. Thank you once again for hanging out with us. We're happy to see you. Happy to hear from you. Um, well, you're hearing from us. Who cares? But in the studio with me, as always, Billy DeTori. Hello. Tanya Metris. Hello. Tony Bicata. Konnichiwa. And on the phone, Deanna Schulmerich. Hello, people. And our expert of all things... Sybil Corbin. Hi. <laughs> She's like, wait a minute, that's pressure. And also joining us for her first time in the studio, but not the first time with us in our hearts, it's Kelsey Grape, our, our intern, one of our favorite interns, one of our favorite people in the, on the planet. Hello. She's like, yeah, no, no, don't stay. You're buttering me up. <laughs> Why are you buttering me up, Chris? Hopefully we don't have to fire her like we had to fire Becca. Oh, Becca got fired ago. like four times the last session. Yeah. It was what? amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Guys, you scared me. Not Billy. No. <laughs> no, we're not firing Billy. Oh. No, yeah. we, we fired Becca because she said something about... Not knowing... I... No, she said something about Phantom Menace or no, something. No, that was me. Was that you? guys you? fired me because I, uh, made, I did I a Jar Jar. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's right. That's what it was. And but I know Tony Becca, Becca got Beck... cut canned a couple of times and then rehired and then fired and then rehired because that's the so, life of an so intern. So, Kelsey, I think you're safe for at least right now. Yeah. We'll fire right. Tony first. All right. Well, okay. see, Kelsey has a special, special place in the... the uh, the, the hierarchy. She's actually Dan's. She's Dan's intern. Oh, so I so can't Dan's fire the her. only person That's who can bad. fire her. You know. <laughs> so you can fire Tony. I fire I, Becca. Exactly. Yeah. I can also fire Emily, but she never. She's never around to fire anyone. <laughs> That's probably a good thing for her. Yeah. So anyway, so that happened, and uh, so welcome yet, and yet you, you can see just how we we treat each other on a regular basis. We it's love a little, each other. Little family here. We do. Uh, so today's topic. We're going to do another one of our foundations since we're still early in our podcasting series. Uh, we've done some foundation chats about Star Wars and Star Trek, the big things, the foundation concept about, you know, comic books and the history of comic books and, and Marvel Universe and DC Universe and stuff like that. Today's going to be another foundational uh, discussion. We're going to talk about one of the, in my personal opinion, cult one followings, of, cult following, one of the biggest cult followings, one of the biggest science fiction shows on television ever. And you can you know tell it's, it's my favorite because I'm kind of trumping <laughs> it up so much. Mess of timey wimey, <laughs> wibbly wobbly stuff. stuff. <laughs> the adventures of the the one and only last of the time lords, Doctor Who. Who? Me? You know, not not Doctor What, Doctor Who. Doctor <laughs> <laughs> there it is. And this is how much of a, of a Doctor Who nerd I am. I actually know that that's from the Fourth Doctor. I know that's the theme <laughs> from Tom Baker's era. I can see there the opening no in words. my head. There are no there words. Really no there words isn't. The do we do. Yep, there it is. I like this. There's just something, you know, almost like ethereal about that music. It's like giving me chills already. I was listening to this while writing a paper the other day. <laughs> <laughs> we say music helps you work. Oh, yeah, it does. Now, this show is is now well over 50 years old at this point. Uh, it started in 1963. It, did. it It didn't have a ton of fanfare because, it, unfortunately, it, it's, it's beginning uh, is hand, hand in hand with a rather tragic and dramatic point in, in our U- U.S. history. It was airing its initial episode the same day that John F. John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. Uh, so that's that's how far back the history of the show goes. It. They did delay mm-hmm. it, but then they re-aired it, and then they re-aired exactly. I did. Look See, at listen stuff to today. you. Yeah. I'm so proud of you. I like Google. <laughs> with the with the very first episode was was uh, titled "The Unearthly Child," and it first started centering around the the young woman Susan, who was the the doctor's granddaughter. At least she always called him grandfather. She it made it, it was the implication that she was from the same planet uh, as the doctor, and so they traveled for a little while, and then she eventually went her on her own way. Didn't they uh, originally set it up as like an educational program for it kids? Was, it was going to be, basically, it was a children's show. And was it going to be Where in the World is San- Carmen San Diego? Exactly. Wait, kind of, kind of thing. Where in the world, world is wow. the doctor at this point? And, and you'll see that, like, with the title of the first of show, many of the shows in the first couple of seasons, you know, with Marco Polo and the Aztecs and... Uh, and there was a variety the the gunfighters. They were, they went back to the old west, the OK Corral. So there was a lot of uh, the original shows were geared towards bringing children into these settings so they could see a little snippet of history. And then along the way, you started introducing him, you know, to some of the classic monsters that we still know in in the mythology of Doctor Who. The very second episode was well, not the very second, but the, you know, the second major episode was the Daleks. Okay. You know, which with the the big salt shaker, you know, you know exactly the, the salt shaker on meals. can with a uh, plunger on exactly. it. Exactly. Don't forget the whisk. <laughs> and you the know whip. the the funny thing is is, is um, I can't think of uh, the original producer's name. Sydney. Oh God. There was oh, Verity Sydney Lambert. Newman. 
Sidney Newman and Verity Lambert. Verity Lambert, it was, it was almost unheard of in the 60s to have a woman being an executive producer of a major show. And here she was bringing this entire show to life. And she, she stuck with it for quite a long time and is tributed for a lot of the big ideas that, that made the show, allowed the show to survive over the years. Now, Sidney Newman had a rule for her, no bug-eyed monsters. And sure enough, by you know the end of the first season, there, there they were in their, their <laughs> plastic rubber-suited glory with the bug-eyed monsters. Um, you know, so certain things kind of had to be give and take. But I think the biggest thing that set the whole thing apart was how they handled the the sickness of the the actor William Hartnell was the first doctor right and how they handled his personal illness uh to remove him from this this show they had a star of the show that this this hit machine that was, a, it was growing in, and after 3 years it was this huge thing and to have the main actor say I can't do this anymore and they're like well are we going to lose this and somebody came up with the brilliant idea of saying well the doctor is an alien so, how about we make it a special thing that when when the doctor's about to die or he's he's really really sick, he can he can renew himself. They didn't use the word regeneration yet. They said renew himself, and it changes his appearance slightly because all of his physiognomy kind of gets shifted around and whatnot. And and we can put a different actor in the part. And it was completely unheard of. You know, it was it was mm-hmm. almost. I mean, looking back, it's yeah. it seems like a stroke of brilliance. It does, and it you know. Is. And, you know, I mean, you can you can go ahead. Well, James Bond over the past 50 years, they've had different actors play the part, but it's always been the same person. You know, it, it, it's funny when you see the memes popping up saying, oh, yeah, well, James Bond's a time lord. But no, you know, it's it's you see recasting <laughs> and you see different shifting and whatnot. But this is fundamentally supposed to be the same person, just with a different appearance, a different slightly different take. And it's allowed the show to kind of reboot itself repeatedly over the years. Thirteen men have now played the, the part on TV. On television, there's also been uh, the day of the doctor. There's, William Hurt. Well, he's one of the thirteen in my in, oh, in, in my your head. opinion. Yeah, in your and head, sorry. Uh, and uh, and then well, Peter Cushing played the doctor in two movies back in the '60s that the BBC had put together, which were almost kind of like they're unrelated. The the doctor in in those movies was not a, he was a human. He was not an alien from a different planet. He was a, an inventor who came up with his own uh, time machine. And then there was a stage play. Uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, no, early 70s. And the doctor was played by a, a fellow named Trevor Nunn, uh, who was a British act, character actor in, in the Shakespearean theater. And then there's been other, there's been like one-offs, and then there's been the the, the comic relief. Um, I can't think of the, the name of it, but Rowan Atkinson had played the, the no, part at one really? point. Really? Oh, yeah. It, it was just, it was like Mr. basically Bean. a parody. What's that, Sibs? Mr. Bean. Bean. Mr. Bean, yeah, Mr. Bean. Uh, it was it was one of those like um, you know like how uh, Robin Williams and, and uh, Billy Crystal and, and Whoopi Goldberg had comic relief. Mm-hmm. Well, the British had their own version of it, and so Rowan Atkinson played the Doctor in a parody mm-hmm. just to kind of like do. And then what was happening is the Doctor kept getting killed. He was rolling through regeneration, so other British actors were coming out. Uh, you know, Jim Broadbent, uh, Hugh Grant, uh, Alan. Um, can't think of his name right now. Uh, but he's he's played a couple of parts in recent Doctor Who episodes. Anyway, and then it ended up with Joanna Lumley from uh, from Absolutely Fabulous <laughs> oh. uh, playing playing one of the final incarnations of the Doctor, and he's like, oh wow, look at this, you know. And, and so, that, but um, it, it created this whole thing of regeneration. And so William Hartnell steps down. Patrick Trotton comes in, and you got to think the weight of the world on, is on this man's shoulders. Patrick Trotton, you know, how do you carry an entire franchise on your shoulders with this f- this freak thing? Yeah, you know, that you know nobody knows if this is going to work or not. And and he just he pulled it off, and it, you see, it, it, this show has now just spins that traction has been dug in, and it's off and off and running. And then since then, you've had John Pertwee and Tom Baker, and yes, I'm going to go through all of them: Peter Davidson, Colin Baker, Sylvester McCoy, Paul McGann, John Hurt, who is now snuck in, uh, that, which was a nice little twist. Christopher Eccleston, um, David Tennant, Matt Smith, and now Peter Capaldi. So, and that's a, see, I did that. You did do that. I did do that. Uh, I practiced. Yeah, I'll, I'll well, admit, it takes can, a lot can of practice. I hop back in, to your initial thing. Cool. You said Sydney Newman. Sydney Newman. You said female. Verity Lambert was female. Oh, Sydney Verity Newman Lambert. was her he's, boss. Oh, okay. Because yeah, I, so, I was like going. I'm like, eh, no, it says that he's male. I didn't yeah, get I know. The, I didn't get the other part, yeah. so I was a little discombobulated. So just checking for the 50th anniversary. Um, I, yeah. Okay. They did uh they did that uh, Adventures in Time and Space where they showed the it was basically they did a dramatization this a story about the creation and you know of Doctor Who and they had um Brian Cox the uh, the character actor play 
Sidney Newman, and it was dead on. I mean, the man, the, the mustache and everything, if you put a picture of Sidney Newman next to a picture of Brian Cox playing Sidney Newman, oh. it was uncanny. It was just, I was just a little confused for a second there. It's, now, it could be that I can't hear very much. I've read that uh, 63 of the early episodes have they don't exist anymore. Right, because oh, yeah. the BBC they're... had this whole thing about recycling, uh, recycling film. And because uh, the first two doctors, the first six years of the show were, were shot on, on film, so they would recycle it, not realizing what hit they had on their hands. Uh, so they didn't have archives and records like we do today. And a lot of the, the serial episodes um, are, are now missing because yeah, of that. There's 97 of them missing. Yeah. And, and now to put it in perspective, it's not 97 entire stories because it was episodic serial television. So the very first, ep- uh, very first show, The Unearthly Child, was actually split up into... Uh, six different episodes, like 20 minutes to a half an hour apiece, much like our podcasts. And, um, <laughs> and so what would happen is, you know, you have those six different pieces of film, those six different episodes, mm-hmm. and a couple of them were lost. Mm-hmm. Now, as a huge, the huge fan you are, mm-hmm. does that drive you insane? It's a little disappointing because I'd like to see more. I'd like to know more about the history of the show. You know, and now admittedly, with, because the, the, the show was split into, t- it's been split in two. Mm-hmm. All right. You had the classic series that went from 1963 to 1986 before it was eventually canceled by the head of uh, head of BBC drama. This guy, Michael Grade, who is like he's he's the Moriarty of of the Doctor Who classic dun, fandom. Dun, dun. Yeah, um, he had he had his uh, his heart set on, on getting rid of that show and he succeeded. But anyway, and then there was this 19 year lapse where there was nothing. There was the American produced one episode of the eighth Doctor, Paul McGann, um, that Fox TV did. And you know, say what you want about Fox, and I really will. Um, it was decent for what it did, and then it went quiet again. And then in 2005, the BBC stepped up uh, with Russell T. Davies as the executive producer and, and main writer, and, and they restored, they brought the, the show back to life. And it's really, to, to say it's had traction would be a severe understatement. So when you have this, this breadth of history... I, I always like to be able to look back and see where it started. I've been watching the show since I was eight. And That's I, I was going to ask. I'm always interested in, mm-hmm. in the stuff people become fans of. Mm-hmm. And how did you be? You're the biggest fan in this room right now. I, yes. I love it. But Tight and lines, we all we're all fans as far as I know. Mm-hmm. But you are the uber fan of this show in this room right now. Yeah, this so this is my thing. How did you become the big fan of this show? And we, I have an engineer behind me. Or, no, it's, it's Wayne. Wayne. Oh, it's Wayne. Wayne. I didn't see him in the shadows. Wayne, Wayne Stock. Wayne's world. Hello, Wayne's, Wayne. world. Yeah. Wayne's world. How you doing, big man? Hi. Did we leave you out in the cold? I had no way to get in. Oh, no. Oh, no. Sorry, brother. Who eventually let you in? I have no idea. Oh, someone did. Though. Well, we're glad you're here. We're talking about Doctor Who right now. Okay. And uh And Billy Sorry. was... <laughs> no, it's all right. And, and Billy was asking me... Um, <laughs> How did you become? How a did fan? I become a what, fan? What age? Like, how did you come across it? I was eight years old when it happened, and I was my, my parents raised me on PBS Channel Twenty One WXXI okay. in Rochester, and and at the time they were still rerunning the Third Doctor, John Pertwee. Six thirty, six the six thirty on uh, every day. Exactly, and it was so it was the early afternoon. So as an eight year old kid, I had an opportunity to run across it. See, and, that's what what I'm curious about mm-hmm. is because I think I started I. I didn't watch it, but like I came across it. Mm-hmm. My brother used to watch it occasionally on the six to six thirty or six thirty to seven somewhere yeah. in that, on PBS, and I believe Tom Baker was the guy. But it was the first run. Would that have been like seventy five ish? Yeah. Well, he was uh, Tom Baker 76. was yeah. yeah. Tom yeah. Baker was Doctor from seventy four to eighty one. Okay, so in that period, I saw the original yes episodes. Most of most, like, most, yeah. most Americans they saw Tom Baker, and then okay. you were what you were seeing in that at that. That early evening block, you were seeing the serial because they were only showing them one episode at a time. Half hour, yeah, the with, half hour with episodes. The cliffhangers, exactly, with the cliffhangers in in place. So to to go full circle on your question, mm-hmm. um, I just remembered the I can re- remember it in my head. The very first episode I ever saw was a John Pertwee episode, and I can't remember which one it was, but it was it was the master was involved. The master who would go on to be the ultimate nemesis of of the Doctor, probably Roger Delgado. I yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely, it was Roger Delgado. Um, and and uh, I was just watching these two people interact, and I wasn't quite understanding it, but it looked cool. And and then there were bug eyed monsters showing up, and then the Doctor had his sonic screwdriver, and things were happening. And then all of a sudden, the, the master is rolling. You know, he's being led off in a in a hovercraft at the end of the episode, making it look like he just pulled one over. And I just remember being fascinated by it. 